Hello, everyone. We are here for Lecture 31, the final lecture of the class. It's our final lecture on Chapter 7, Radiation Therapy and Radiation Safety. And today we're going to see uh, some ideas that how radiation therapy is actually utilized in a clinical setting, the career that many of the medical physicists out of our department have been training for all along. As a fun little blast from the past, I thought we would do one multiple choice question together, one last multiple choice question together. And I'm asking you, what is the principal reason that modern radiation therapies are delivered in multiple fractions, which is a small amount of radiation, which sums up to the total dose administered, spaced out in time over weeks? There are certainly several benefits. We're going to see that today. But one of these is the main reason we deliver therapy this way. So again, I think I went over this in a previous lecture. If someone in your family is unfortunately undergoing radiation therapy and he or she asks you, why do I have to go back every day for 30, 40 days? Why can't they do it all at once? What would you tell them? These are all one sentence answers. And one of them is correct and it's actually pretty simple. So as always, pause it, take a look at them, write down your answer. And then when you're ready to hear the answer, unpause it and we'll discuss it together. So pause now. Okay, if you're back, you've unpaused and you've had a time to think of these five things. What is the main reason that you thought? What was your choice? Yeah, number two, it allows the healthy cells time to repair. All right, there are going to be other reasons, but really the reason is the repair of the healthy cells. We talked about this two lectures ago and we're gonna talk about it more today. The key to this is when you irradiate someone, either with radioactive seeds or with external beam therapy, they are going to get a dose and you are going to irradiate the healthy cells and the cancer cells equally. In fact, because the dose builds up quickly but then diminishes as it goes to the body, if it's a deep-seated tumor, you are certainly delivering more dose to some of the tissues than the cancer. The key is some of those healthy cells can repair and recover and they do so better than the cancer cells. So if we combine the fact that they repair and recover better with the fact that we're gonna be able to move the beam around from different angles to allow the dose to add up in the cancer but be minimized everywhere else, then we're coming up with a really good effective strategy for treating cancers with radiation beams. So let's see how that works. Let's remind ourselves, this is a slide from two lectures ago. This is the alpha to beta ratio. So this graph was really important. Confusing graph, I do admit it, but all medical physicists know about the alpha to beta ratio. When the alpha beta to ratio is small, like about one, like it is for late responding tissues, then at lower doses, when you deliver a low dose, the surviving fraction will be higher than for tumors and late responding and early responding tissues. Tumors and early responding tissues have a uh, large uh, alpha to beta ratio. So it's one at about 10 gray, all right? So the late responding tissues are one at roughly three gray, but this guy is one at about 10 gray, all right? So it's this range over here. It's the range over which when D equals alpha to beta, it's when it starts to curve over from kind of linear to kind of quadratic. It occurs much later. So remember, that's what that alpha to beta ratio was. When D equals alpha to beta, that is the dose at which it's done being linear and starting to be quadratic. And that kicks in much later, um, obviously at like 10 gray for the tumors and early responding tissues. So that means that this guy curves a little more quickly which means that it's all this gap right here, the repair gap. We're gonna see that's one of the R's you need to learn about for today, repair. Healthy tissues, late responding tissues, repair better at low doses. At higher doses, they do worse, right? The blue line is below the red line out here. You're killing more healthy cells with a high amount of dose. So you wanna be operating somewhere up here where all things being equal, the healthy cells can recover, repair themselves, and you're preferentially killing tumors and other early responding tissues. Okay, so let's just get into this lecture and talk about some of these concepts. So I need you to understand this idea of the therapeutic ratio. So this is a graph from Kane. You should have seen this. The idea is all radiotherapy is based on this. Healthy cells and tumor cells do not react to radiation the same way. So 
at a given dose of radiation, say this dashed line, it might kill a small amount of healthy cells. It's going to kill way more tumor cells. That's great. Unfortunately, you chose this dose to be too low. Uh, you killed a few healthy cells. Yeah, but a lot of tumor cells survived, so that's no good. You could up the dose to somewhere up here. Well, this is okay. You've actually killed all the tumor cells, but look how many healthy cells you killed. So somewhere in the middle is the Goldilocks spot. It's a dose used for treatment where all the tumor cells are killed, which is your requirement, and you've minimized the killing of some of the healthy cells. So you're actually going to deliver on something that looks like that. So this is only possible. The fact that there is a dose which maximizes killing of tumors minimizes killing of healthy cells. The only reason such a thing exists is because this curve, the tumor cell curve, and the healthy cell curve are separated. That separation is called the therapeutic ratio. The therapeutic ratio is basically, uh, it's the ratio of doses required to produce some effect in a healthy cell as opposed to the tumor cells. So it's some desired effect. It's 100% tumor control. Here I'm showing, say, 50% killing. I'm showing this because it's easy for you guys to see. You are desiring some effect. The effect you're desiring is I want 50% of those cells to be dead. That's this red dashed line here, right? That makes sense. What is the dose required to accomplish that in the tumor cells? It's this dose right here, whatever it is, this blue dose, dose to achieve it in tumor. So you know that number. What dose is required to kill 50% of healthy cells? You have to come all the way over. You drop this line down, the dose to achieve it in the healthy cells. Those two doses are not the same. So the dose of this to this is the therapeutic ratio. And we obviously want that to be as large as possible. The larger that ratio is, the more separated these two curves are. If this curve was actually all the way over here, and this curve was all the way over here, there could be a dose in the middle that kills 100% of the tumor cells and none of the healthy cells. That's not real. It doesn't actually work that way. Uh, but that would be the idea you want to picture to try to figure out uh, what the dose would actually be. Curves are actually more like this. They're never actually separated. There is no magic dose that kills 100% of tumors and kills no healthy cells. That would be beautiful if it was true, but it's not true. It doesn't work that way. So this is the idea of the therapeutic ratio. I'm showing a tumor response curve in blue or purple and a normal tissue response curve in red. All right. So if tumor and normal cells had response curves just like this, we would not use radiation, right? Because to kill 100% of the cells, say right here, you come across, it's the dose is the same. Same amount of dose to kill 100% of normal cells and tumor cells. So every time you irradiate someone to kill tumor, you're killing just as many normal cells. We would have to come up with a better way to treat cancers than that. All right, so that's not very effective. In reality, tumors are preferentially killed by low doses of radiation. So that curve shifts to the left. Here's their original position in the middle. And the tumor curve shifts to the left, and the normal tissue curve shifts to the right. It's the splitting. That splitting is the therapeutic ratio. Tumors are preferentially killed by low doses of radiation, right? If you go to high doses, yeah, they're all killed 100%, no problem. But look, at, at any low dose down here, you're preferentially killing. This is not a survival curve because this is showing the percentage of cells killed. At any low dose, you're killing way more tumor cells than normal tissue cells. That's the therapeutic ratio. And that just occurs naturally in nature because tumor cells are dividing so quickly. They're growing out of control. They're constantly dividing. It makes them very susceptible to DNA damage, which is what we're targeting with our radiation. And so they preferentially die. Normal tissues are not tougher. They just don't divide as often. So they're not as sensitive to radiation. That's lucky for us. Okay, so here now 100% kill dose in the tumor is well separated from the 100% kill dose in the normal tissue. The ratio of those two doses to each other is the therapeutic ratio. All right, and like I said, that occurs just naturally in tumor cells and normal cells. Um, 
what we can do, though, what we do as medical physicists is try to find things which makes the tumor easier to kill. Let me do that again. Anything we can do that shift this curve further to the left, we call that a radio sensitizer. It makes the tumor cells more sensitive to radiation therapy. So these are things that are radio sensitizers. If there's chemicals we can add, if there's treatments we can do, I'll talk about some of those, then that is a radio sensitizing treatment. Conversely, if there are things we can do to the patient to move the normal tissues to the right, let me do that again. Look how it moves to the right. Anything which makes normal tissue harder to kill, we call that a radial protector. And there are things we can do that. So sometimes now in modern radiotherapies at the most advanced teaching hospitals, they're doing all kinds of treatments like this. You're getting radiation, but they might be doing therapies to make the tumor cells more sensitive, to protect the normal cells a little bit. Anything to widen out this therapeutic ratio is going to improve patient outcomes. So it's really worth trying to do. So the therapeutic ratio, although this, it's not a number that they actually calculate, uh, I've never heard a medical physicist actually say, oh, the therapeutic ratio of this is 2.86. They don't really think that way. They're just looking for the survivals of normal tissues over regular tissue, over tumor tissues, okay? So how do we treat tumors? I'm gonna take you to a video in a little bit. This is the LINAC, Linear Accelerator. Windsor Regional Cancer Center, which if we had still been doing tours this semester, you would have seen them out there, has, I believe, four of these machines. This is actually, this is not a picture from Windsor Regional, but this is the exact model that they have. It's a Varian Clinac machine. This is a giant x-ray machine, not for imaging, but for delivering x-ray beams. They're going to come out of the head. The patient is going to lay on the bed here. The bed is going to move in the way. This beam can irradiate the patient and then it rotates 360 degrees around the patient to deliver radiation from any angle that you want. So we no longer treat radiation with one giant x-ray beam coming through the patient because that would kill all the tissues all the way around. Instead, we're going to be clever. We're going to shoot them in at different angles. Everywhere the beams overlap, dose is purely additive. The dose will add up and you'll deliver a lot of dose in the target region. The dose is out here where only one beam goes through. They're getting some dose, that is true, but it's way lower than the dose in the middle that's getting hit by all these beams. So the idea of this is called external beam radiation therapy. It is applied with a linear accelerator, which we call LINAC, is this. Radiation therapy begins with a linear accelerator. The linear accelerator speeds electrons through the linear accelerator region. Aim, uh, it hits, they go around this bending magnet. So the electron beams in this thing come through. They go around in a loop, 270 degrees. They hit this foil and they generate this huge intense beam of x-rays coming straight down out of the head. We do something else then. There's a multi-leaf collimator. That's pictured right here. We have taken very careful CT images of the tumor to irradiate. It's built into what's called a treatment plan. We shape this beam that no matter what angle we're shooting the x-rays in, the shape of the beam exactly matches the shape of the tumor from that angle. So the radiation beam is precisely tailored to the shape of the patient's tumor with the multi-leaf collimator. It also minimizes the radiation because these are lead leaves to any other part of the body. And then this is all computer controlled. It has a three-dimensional image of the tumor taken by a CT, and then this whole head will circulate around to deliver the dose to the tumor that depends on the oncologist's specifications. So let's take a look at how this actually works. This is Varian, the company that makes it. A lot of medical physicists working for Varian. Like I said, this is the actual unit we have at Windsor Regional. I hope you guys get to see it someday. It's super, super cool. Here's a video from Varian. Let's just watch a little bit of it and see what we can learn about the linear accelerator. This is a pretty cool video. I don't think I can get it on high def here. Today, clinicians at leading institutions are using Varian Smart Beam Intensity Modulated Radiation Therapy, better known as IMRT, to treat cancer patients. Varian Smart Beam IMRT is accurate, it is the fastest IMRT technique, it is fast. and it is also very reliable. Each fraction we deliver is only about Smart a Beam IMRT long, treatments are clinically all, delivered by a Varian clinic a fully computerized medical linear accelerator. 
The unique design of this machine permits a highly accurate delivery of desired dose distributions to the tumour, while minimising the amount of dose to critical organs and surrounding healthy tissue. That's the electron accelerator. That's why they call it a linear accelerator. The beam can be accurately controlled and shaped to the tumour with a collimation system consisting of two sets of jaws and a dynamically controlled multi-leaf collimator. IMRT treatment delivery is verified using Varian's portal vision system mounted on a robotic arm. The IMRT field is delivered without the patient. The predicted dose from the Eclipse Helios treatment planning system is compared with the measured dose from portal vision. Different tools permit the analysis and comparison of the two dose matrices. Treatments are performed by delivering a number of treatment fields. In the following prostate treatment example, five MIRT fields will be delivered. That's the multi-leaf collimator. The delivery is fully dynamic, using the sliding window technique, where each pair of leaves form a small moving window. This way, the dose is modulated by the size and the speed of these windows. You can make that beam any shape you want. Looking inside the patient shows us the dose contribution of this first field. All right, so if you just did one field, it would look like that. The target course. volume and the organ at risk are clearly visible. Right. You're getting more dose out here than down here. The second it's field is way. delivered from a different direction. Yep, illuminate from that way. For every beam, you're getting more Again, dose. Again, the beam moves quickly speed. over the organ at risk in order to limit the dose delivered to it. The treatment continues with the third field. Coming in from underneath, sorry, it was coming in from underneath there, coming in from underneath there. The fourth field. More dose here, more dose there. More dose here. But see how the dose is adding and up? And the fifth field. It sums up, it's additive. Dose is just linearly additive. The result shows the dose contribution the from each field in the target. Comparing the smart beam IMRT technique with a 3D conformal four fields box technique. The this AP the field, a first lateral field, the PA field, and an opposing lateral field. Okay, so sure, let me just pause it there for a second. Yeah, they used to do it with four fields. You've got complete coverage. You can see the prostate. So this is the oncologist has marked this out. The radiation oncologist has said you need to deliver this much radiation dose here, but look at all the areas that get way more dose than is necessary. And there's some really sensitive organs in here. The prostate goes around uh, the urethra, and this is called an organ at risk. You really don't want to irradiate that. Look at all the dose delivered to completely 100% healthy tissue. There's no tumor out here or here or here. In prostate cancer, the prostate is just the cancer is just in the prostate, which is this red region. You're delivering massive amounts of dose where you don't need to deliver anything. So this will do it, sure, but one, you're not mapping to the shape of the prostate very well, and you're delivering massive amounts of dose to other places, as opposed to when you can shape that beam. Let's resume. Comparing two techniques in one plane shows the higher dose conformance in the target for the IMRT method. A three-dimensional surface dose display shows the results even more clearly. The IMRT technique provides excellent coverage of the target while limiting the dose to the two organs at risk. The clinical advantages are obvious. I think they're obvious. Critical tissue sparing. Of course. Tumor control probability. Definitely. Lower radiation-induced toxicity. Very important leading to better quality of life and fewer side effects. Which is what you're trying to do. Varian's That's technical advantages point. are proven and reliable technology, highest possible resolution, comprehensive quality assurance tools, and the system is fully dynamic. So a lot of what the medical physicists do in Windsor is a lot of this. Uh, the, the, the Varian uh, Linux are the tool that they use for most of their treatments. They spend a lot of time doing quality assurance. 
They do a lot of time troubleshooting them, fixing them, getting them repaired where people have to come in, making sure that they're working up to spec, uh, making sure that the dose being delivered is calculated accurately. So they're working on these machines a lot. I would say that's the largest fraction of their job is involved with and surrounding the use of the linear accelerators here in Windsor. Key components of the system are the gridded gun, so that's the patented an energy switch, the high efficiency standing waveguide, the achromatic three field bending magnet, the real time beam control steering system, the small focal spot, the 10 port carousel, the dual sealed iron chamber, two sets of independent asymmetric jaws, the dynamic multi-leaf collimator and the portal vision for IMRT verification. Okay, that's enough. So you can see that these accelerators are pretty awesome pieces of technology. I think they cost about a million a piece, something like that. And of course, they have to go in a radiation suite that's completely shielded in lead. There's a lot of infrastructure that goes with it. So they're expensive. Um, Windsor Region, like I said, has three or four of them. And that's actually a fairly small clinic. Um, if you had been able to see it when we go out there, you would have seen these things. These are the things that we have to go out at 4.30 to use. They're in use all day long. Uh, they treat at least until 4.30, sometimes 5 o'clock. Uh, they treat patients all the time, like I said, about 20 minutes per patient. The actual treatment, eh, maybe 15 minutes. The treatment itself is not that long, two minutes, three minutes. It takes just as long to actually get the patient well, you know, they're mostly ambulatory, so they walk in, they lay down on this bed here, the technicians get them situated, there's laser beams on each side of the room that creates a cross in space. I'm going to talk about the point, you can see this is the laser right here, it comes over, there's a spot right hanging in space, it's exactly a meter underneath the x-ray source here and it hangs in space there and because this whole unit rotates around that, and this thing on the floor can swivel around. This is the center of the room called the ISO center. And the idea is to put the tumor right there and then all the treatment is planned around it. So uh, that's the uh, linear accelerator. So let's go on and uh, take a look at uh, some of the advantages of the linear accelerator. All right, so we saw this before. You can see that the, if you're doing prostate, any tumor, any tumor, if you do the, this is intensity modulation, intensity modulated radiation therapy, you can get much better coverage of the cancer and much less tissue sparing of healthy tissues because look at all the green colors here and there's almost no green colors in healthy tissues over here where color is dose. The red colors are a lot of dose and very light blue colors are almost no dose. All right. So I want to talk to you about the geometry of the LINAC. Uh, just, a, you know, you're not going to be linear accelerator operators after this, but I want you to know some of the words. This is really important. So what is the geometry of a linear accelerator? Here is a patient. Uh, I, I could have just put a patient here, but this is a phantom that they use for measuring radiation uh, testing. They can put probes and stuff inside this thing. Here's the head of the linear accelerator. The x-ray beam comes out in some shape. We call this shape the field. The field can be whatever shape or size you want is determined by those jaws and that multi-leaf collimator to shape it to a tumor. The patient is positioned underneath the linear accelerator and the tumor is located at the point called the isocenter. It's the critical point in the linear accelerator suite because it's the axis of rotation of the linear accelerator. Everything rotates around that. So the tumor has to be there and all of our calculations are based on the tumor being there and it's a set distance away from the source of the x-ray beam. So the field size is adjustable. So here I'm showing maybe it's a small field like four by four centimeters. Here's a big field, 10 by 10 centimeters if you're not shaping at all. So that's what we mean by the field. And it's, that's just accomplished by opening and closing the jaws up here. Big, big, thick lead jaws. You saw the picture of that. Okay, you need to know isocenter. You need to know another acronym called the source to axis distance. So the source to axis distance is the source of x-rays here down to the axis of rotation, which is the isocenter, and that's where you put the tumor. Source to axis of rotation distance, SAD. And in most linear accelerator applications, that's one meter or 100 centimeters. 
and that is designed to not change as you go around the patient. Conversely, the distance from the source, which is still here, to the surface of the skin, if that tumor is buried, is not 100 centimeters. It can't be more, but it almost certainly is less than 100. And we call that SSD, source to surface distance. So the tumor's at the isocenter. The distance from the isocenter to the source is the SAD. The distance from the source to the skin is the source to surface distance, SSD. So the geometry looks like this. I'm removing the patient from here for now. This whole thing is going to rotate around the patient. And when you do that, the SAD stays the same. It's, it's one meter, right? You're doing something like that. It just doesn't change. This is the SAD. I just couldn't make my picture rotate around it, but it looks like that. The SAD never changes. So all your calculations are based on, okay, your tumor is exactly one meter away from the source of x-rays. It'll tell you how strong the x-ray field is going to be right there. But when I put a body, now this is a very strange square-shaped body in place, but the SSD does change, right? Because here the SSD is quite small, and here the SSD is quite large, because a person is not a round, circular shape. A person has a weird three-dimensional shape. And so because the SSD changes at every angle, you have to take that into consideration. It goes into the treatment plan, all right? When this thing calculates how much how long to dwell at each shape, it's taking that SSD into consideration because x-rays get more attenuated when they have to travel deeper through the body. You have to take that into consideration. This is why the patient is completely CT'd many times before, during, and after treatment. So there's a complete three-dimensional model of the patient in the computer that's controlling this beam that's shooting the x-rays into you as it circles around. I need you to know another very important idea, which is called the percent depth dose. So here I'm showing one of the still frames from that movie we just watched. This is an x-ray beam coming from up here, going through the patient and emerging down here. We're using this beam to treat a prostate target right here. Obviously, because the x-ray beam gets weaker as you go through, the dose is strongest up here, it's weakest down here. It's somewhere in the middle, in the middle. Okay, we are trying to deliver a dose at depth D. We call that D sub D. All right, it is whatever it is here. Say the doctor says you want one gray here. Fine, I can put one gray there. That would be D sub D. But it's less than the dose up here, which is the maximum dose, D sub M. D sub M would be bigger than D sub D. How do you know how much bigger it is? There are tables that tabulate all this. And it's related by the idea of percent depth dose. Percent depth dose is just equal to D sub D over D sub M times 100%. All right, so D sub D is always going to be less than D sub M. How do you know? Because this is dose maximum. This can't be bigger than that. All right, so if PDD is like 70%, that means that the dose at depth is about 0.7% times whatever the maximum dose is. And that's important because this dose you have to deliver to kill the tumor. But it tells you how big is the dose going to be upstream and can the tissues up here handle that dose. All right? So the idea of PDD, really important. It looks like this. So I'm just showing uh, another plot. Okay, let's look at this guy. So dose is maximum D the dose at its maximum location is D sub M here. Dose at depth is D sub D here. And this would be looking at, because you can see the dose, we've seen this curve before, the dose decreases through the body. The maximum dose is up here at this hump, but you're delivering it at some depth down there. D, PDD is just the dose at that depth divided by the maximum dose times 100%. And this number will be anywhere from 100% if it's very, very, very close. And it goes down to, I don't know, like 30, 20% or something for things that are really, really deep in the body. And then you have to be careful because you're trying to kill a tumor. But if it's 20%, that means you're delivering five times more dose upstream. Okay, that tells you one beam is never going to be an effective therapy for this. You're going to want to use multiple beams, right? So... This is just, uh, I'm kind of overlaying those two pictures. Here's the axis of the beam. 
here's the axis of the beam. Dose is maximized here, dose is maximized here, dose at depth here is lower, dose at depth here is lower. So just remember this equation. I'm probably going to ask you some kind of a question using this equation and somehow using your knowledge of this geometry. All right, so here we can see how the dose falls off. There's different ways of showing dose. Um, this is a 2D color plot, so you can imagine the X-ray beam coming from above, irradiating a patient down here and the dose just falls off with distance inside the patient. But it also falls off at the edges of the field. It's not a complete square. So if you were looking at the field end on, usually our PDD idea is right on the axis of that beam, where the beam's at maximum strength, and it gets a little bit weaker as you go off to one side of the beam. It's just so nothing's a perfect square. It just, we can't make them that way. Uh, we try hard to make it as perfect as possible, but nothing is a perfect uniform field. So usually we can use color maps like that. These are called isodose plots, kind of contour plots, however you want to display that dose. All right, so do understand the idea of PDD. Again, if you don't understand it, make a note to yourself, get in touch with me during our office hours, we can talk about it. It's not a complicated idea, but you just have to think about it right. Okay. Last topic, we're almost done for the semester. Can you believe it? Amazing. I really wish you guys uh, were with me to be talking about all this. Um, sorry we have to do it uh, over the video. Not as good as face-to-face, -face, but hopefully you're uh, getting something out of these lectures. Last topic is the very important ideas of the four R's of radiobiology. Okay, I want you to know the four R's of radiobiology. Very, very, very famous idea in radiobiology. The four R's are Repair, redistribution, which some people call reassortment, but I like redistribution, reoxygenation, repopulation, RR, RR. I don't know why they don't call it the four RE's of radiobiology, because they're all RE, 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 but it's easier to say four R's. Repair, redistribution, reoxygenation, repopulation. This leads right back into the multiple choice question that I started our lecture with. Most modern radiotherapies administer administer a total dose of 40 to 60 gray in smaller 1 to 2 gray fractions administered once per day for about 4 to 6 weeks. Why? Actually, all of these things feed into that answer. That's why I said in the multiple choice question at the beginning, there's multiple reasons why. The answer I gave you was true, the most important reason. But all four of these reasons factor into this. So if you want a simple answer for a parent, you can just say, it's what the answer to the multiple choice was. It's so the healthy tissues can repair. Done. If you're on a long car drive and they're actually really interested, you can go into a more complicated story and say, well, let me tell you about the four R's of radiobiology. Because what we know about the four R's of radiobiology tell us that delivering treatment in this way, about 40 to 60 gray in smaller one to two gray fractions administered for four to six weeks is the best way of treating it. All four inform that decision. At that point, they'll probably say, yeah, that's enough. Give me the short answer, in which case you can give them the short answer. But if you know someone who's a physicist or really interested, they're going to want to know these things. So let us see if you could tell that tale to them from your memory. So let's start. We're going to go through each of these four in sequence. Here we go. Repair, R number one. We saw this before. This was the main reason. Fact, cells can repair damage from radiation. That is true. So this is how you want to explain it to them. When you cause damage in a cell due to radiation, all cells can repair damage from that radiation. And at low doses, minimal damage is caused by low doses due to cell repair. We know that. Combine fact one with fact two. Normal tissues and tumors don't repair the same. All right, at low doses, healthy normal tissues repair a little better. These two facts right there lead you to these conclusion. At lower doses, normal tissues can repair damage better than tumors. Smiley face. You are happy about that. That's a good thing. But a low dose doesn't kill a tumor. Frowny face. That's a bad thing. Solution. Give many low doses fractions, which the healthy tissues can survive, but that so the total tumor receives a total dose which will kill it. 
but each low dose fraction does damage that normal tissues can recover from, which is repair. So this is the way I'm going to present each of the four R's. Fact, fact, thing that makes you happy or sad, and what is your solution? So your solution to these facts and these problems is, I know what I'll do. Let me give a bunch of low dose fractions. So overall, the tumor will receive a total dose prescribed by the radiation oncologist, but each low dose fraction is low enough, which is about one gray, such that the damage that's done, normal tissue can recover from much better than the tumors. And when the patient is done, the tumor will have died and the healthy tissues will have been spared as much as possible. That is repair, the first R of radiobiology. I hope you can understand that. The second R of radiobiology is redistribution or reassortment. This has to do with the cell cycle. So this is just a snapshot of a slide that I showed in our lecture on radiobiology. So you have to remember what the cell cycle is. Here are the facts that we need to know. Fact number one, cells in different stages of the cell cycle are not affected but the same by radiation. We talked about that before. There's very radiosensitive phases. If you hit radiation right here in this late G1, it's gonna go right into a checkpoint and that cell is dead. On the other hand, if you hit it radiation right after the G1 checkpoint, it's got all this time to repair itself and fix itself, and it might not kill it by the time it gets here. So the cell is not equally radiosensitive at all the stages. Fact number two, not all cells move through the cycle at the same rate. There's just a normal variation. Remember I said it was something like 24 hours before? Sure, but some cells might be doing it in 16. Some cells might be doing it in 30. So these are two facts which are incontrovertible. At different stages of the cycle, the cell is more or less radiosensitive, and all the cells are in different stages of the cycle. So if they were all in phase with each other, you'd say, oh, I know. Let me just irradiate it at a time where they're all sensitive, and I'll kill them all. You cannot do that because you don't know what stage they're in, and they're all different anyways. So what this means is when you deliver a dose, you're going to kill all the cells that are radiosensitive, and the cells that are left are the toughest ones to kill. They're radio resistant. We call this partial synchronization. It's because you've killed off all the ones in a certain stage. The ones that remain were all the ones that were in the radio resistant stage. So now they're kind of partially synchronized and they're gonna be harder to kill. This makes me sad because now they're harder to kill. I don't like that. So what are we gonna do? Here's a solution. We will wait some time usually 24 hours. This is why we do it every day, but we don't wait two days, and this is why we don't really wait four hours. We want about 24 hours because the cells will cycle through at different rates. Remember I said some do 16, some 30, whatever. What was partially synchronized after the radiation therapy treatment is going to get redistributed, meaning when you come back 24 hours later, the cells are now once again going to be randomly distributed through the cell cycle. You'll treat with another low dose fraction. You're gonna kill off the radio sensitive ones again. You're gonna leave the radio resistant ones again. And then you just repeat, wait another 24 hours. The cells will randomly redistribute through the cell cycle. And you keep doing that over and over and over. So the waiting of the 24 hours allows the cells not to be synchronized in a cycle where they're harder to kill. It means that each time you deliver a fraction, you're killing a certain percentage, but you know what percentage that is. Right? It's always the same percentage that's more resistant and more sensitive. The cells have redistributed through the cell reproductive cycle as a consequence of waiting 24 hours. The second R of radiobiology. Third R, reoxygenation. Here is a close-up of a really ugly, nasty tumor. Tumors are horrible little growths. They're trying to grow like some sort of weird organ or something, but they're terrible at it. They're just a loose conglomeration of cells. That's why they're so dangerous. They can break off and form, they can metastasize, spread to other parts of your body. When they get big enough, they try to grow a blood supply and they're horrible at it. They don't have really nice vessels like that. The blood kind of oozes around and drips and dribbles and diffuses through it and it's awful. But as a result of that, there's large parts, usually the cores of tumor, that are getting no blood at all. So they actually start to die. You would think that would be good, but it's actually not. Because we know two things. Fact one, when you do that DNA damage from your radiotherapy, 
that DNA damage is made permanent. And the word we use for that is fixed. Fixed doesn't mean I made it better. Fixed means you've affixed it permanently to the DNA. For that to happen, DNA damage must happen in the presence of oxygen. This is really interesting. If you deprive the DNA of any free oxygen, when you cause that damage, that DNA can actually repair itself much better. So you want a lot of oxygen in and around the cells and in and around the DNA to make that DNA damage you do permanent. That's a fact. Fact two is, because of their poor vasculature, the cores of tumor, which is all this region here, they are filled with hypoxic, which means cells that are in a state of oxygen starvation, or necrotic, which is means cells that are dead cells. This is a normal, massive tumor. Normoxic, healthy, reproducing cancer cells on the outside with a normal amount of oxygen. A hypoxic region towards the core, which is a state of less than normal oxygen and a necrotic core. But the problem is, is this hypoxic core is not gonna be killed because the cores of tumors have very little hypoxic or no oxygen many or most of these cells cannot be killed at radiation at all. They're effectively radio-resistant. This makes me very sad, frowny face. In fact, some of these hypoxic cells can survive over 10 times the normal dose that will kill the rest of the tumor. How are you going to kill them? You cannot deliver enough radiation to a patient to kill these hypoxic cells without killing all the healthy tissue. These are effectively eternal radio-resistant cells. This is a big, big problem. That's why I have the frowny face. Ah, but we have a solution. What is our solution? Let's wait some time. Again, fractionation. Let's wait 24 hours. During that 24 hours of which you've killed all these normoxic tumor cells, you've exposed the hypoxic cells which did not die, but by waiting 24 hours, the cancer cells are going to try to regrow and pro proliferate. They are going to grow their own vasculature. They're going to grow their own blood vessels, which is going to allow fresh oxygen to make its way into the hypoxic cells and get oxygen in there. We call that reoxygenation. The cells that had been starved of oxygen now get replenished with oxygen. They are reoxygenated. Now they are ready for killing with the next dose of radiation. So you wait 24 hours, let blood vessels regrow, bring in oxygen to the cells you didn't kill, come back, treat with another low dose fraction. You kill those cells, always going to leave a core in a hypoxic resistant stage, but you keep doing it. Each time you treat, there are fewer and fewer cells remaining. The core of the tumor is always necrotic and hypoxic, but each time there's less and less overall cells. So by the time you do this 20, 30, 40 times, there will be no cells left. So reoxygenation, the third R of radiobiology. And what was the fourth R of radiobiology? Ask yourself honestly, do you remember? Think about it. Do you really remember? What did we say? Repair, redistribution, reoxygenation. What was the fourth R? I bet you don't remember. It's okay. It was repopulation, all right? So repair, redistribution, reoxygenation, repopulation. So let's go through this last and final R. Fact, tumors are always growing. It is the hallmark of cancer cells. They don't stop. They are eternally dividing and their internal checkpoints have failed, leading to unlimited growth. If left unchecked, that's why people die of cancer. The tumors never stop, and they will eventually take over everything, all right? And they'll starve all the other cells of nutrition, and the patient dies, all right? So that is a fact. So what we have seen is while radiation is highly effective at killing tumor cells, that is true, the remaining cells that are left behind when you don't kill them, because remember, you're coming back 40 times, the ones that are not killed in any one fraction are always going to be harder to kill, and they are always dividing. So you're leaving behind a population that is harder and harder to kill. The longer you take to kill them, the more time they have to regrow, right? It kind of makes sense. You're trying to kill them 
because you know at this stage you might be wondering well gosh dr ac these first three r's make it seem like you can really spare healthy tissue and kill cancer cells why stop at 40 days why not do 80 days why not do 120 days this fourth r is the reason why you well, let's just let it grow a year let's do it once a day for a whole year this fourth r is why not it reaches a point where you don't you're not helping anymore you have to kill those tumor cells eventually every time you treat you're leaving a tougher segment behind a segment a population that's harder to kill and they are going to regrow and repopulate the entire tumor the longer you wait the more dose it takes to kill all of them that's shown right here so a total dose so maybe you have some tumor if the total treatment time takes 50 days if you deliver a total dose of 20 if you wait 30 days now it takes maybe 52 two grays if you wait 40 days now maybe it takes 63 grays if you wait 50 days now it makes 70 grays right so just going from 20 to 50 days the dose that's required to kill them has gone from 50 to 70 gray and now you're seriously damaging the patient so you can see from this type of behavior waiting does not help so you can't go too early but you can't string it out you can't string it out any longer Otherwise, these tumor cells will repopulate, and then the tumor just regrows and it's ignoring your radiation. So our solution, the fourth R, to avoid repopulation total treatment time must be limited. It cannot go on indefinitely. So 20 to 40 days is standard. Some treatments are 20, some are 40. I don't know many treatments that go beyond 40. Beyond that, you're just not gonna help and you're not gonna eventually control the tumor, which means removing all the cancer cells. All right, so the four R's of radiobiology tell you all those things. Remember what we started with. The four R's should now explain this answer. Why are radiotherapies administered in dose of 40 to 60 grays in smaller one to two gray fractions? Now you know why they're administered once per day and not like once an hour or once per week and why the total treatment time is about four to six weeks. The four R's tell you each of those things. That's why they are so important to know. They really inform much of our modern understanding of radiation treatment. Guess what? We are done. That is the course. You guys have now learned as much about radiation therapy as I would expect a second year physics students to know. I would say you now know more about radiation therapy than almost anybody in Windsor, except for the radiation oncologists. I would say you know more about this than many, many physicians do. There's a whole lot more to learn about this. It's a really exciting field. This radiobiology is one of the specialty classes that you will take if you go to medical physics graduate school. You're going to learn about risk assessment and things like that as well. So I thank you very much for your diligence this semester. Uh, I know I made you guys work a lot. I'm sure you think it was a lot. I think it is a lot. I hope after the course is over, you're going to see the benefit of it. Um, I, I wasn't making you work that hard just because I want you to work hard. I, I hope I've shown you from the feedback I've gotten from other students. Um, when they go out, they realize that this hard work has really benefited them. You're going to know things that other people don't know. You're going to be able to use these facts that other people are not in possession of to reach new conclusions, um, to be able to have a deeper understanding of other phenomena that other people, including other physicists, don't have. It's worth the work to understand these things. Um, I hope you realize there's more physics underneath all of this. We didn't always get into so many equations and so many formulae when we were doing this. But as always, I wanted you to understand the knowing is the most important thing. We can always apply math and equations later, but if you don't know why you're doing something, if you don't understand what it's all about, what's the point in doing math and equations? In my understanding as a physicist, there is no point in applying those equations blindly. But to be able to understand what the problem is and how to tackle it, you can always figure out the equations later. But the understanding is how you know where to look for these things. So you'll get that information later. But I think this is the first uh, stepping point. Uh, it's your kind of inroad into the subject. And you guys know a lot now. Um, if we had time, what would be fun? We don't 
would be to go back uh, and look at some of our, uh, you know, random questions that I gave you on the first day. Just a bunch of stuff that I said, there's no way on earth that a physicist would know these things. Well, um, you know, now you would know them. Um, and you'd be surprised what you knew. On the first day, I don't think anybody got those questions right. I think now I would expect you to get almost all of them correct. Um, you've gained a lot, even if you feel like you have what you have, because you to motivate. Uh, I look forward to talking about all you love your homework, and uh, well, you don't have your homework. And this is Clavin again, right forward. And this is Sam. Thanks a lot, guys. Bye.